Good morning from Los Angeles. I am Lance Lysowski, the Sapers beat writer for the Buffalo News, coming to you live Monday morning ahead of the Sabres game in Los Angeles against the Kings. I thought this would be a good time to circle back to the, some of the mailbag questions that you all submitted last week. Again, I, I did a video form of these. Um, it was probably about a week at this point. Got some positive feedback, got some negative feedback. Either way, this is something I'm going to try to just mix into the coverage. To be honest with you, I know that people really enjoy the written version, and I do as well. It gives me more room to really expand on a few thoughts, take more questions. But I think it's also important to give people more of an opportunity to have their qu questions answered. Because, you know what, just... With all the games, the practices, there's not always time for a mailbag. There's not as much downtime between games as there is on the Bills. So just trying to find a happy medium. Uh, thank you all for listening last week. I've got a few questions loaded up right now for you all. Let's dive into them. And again, if you ever have one you want to submit, you can find me on Twitter, L-L-Y-S-O-W-S-K-I, or email L-L-Y-S-O-W-S-K-I at buffnews.com. Let's go ahead and get to the questions. Jeffrey Tay, Jeffrey, thank you for the question. Do you feel that general manager Kevin Adams is willing to give up some future potential quality to get quality players that can help the Sabres now? Yes, Jeffrey, I do think that for the right cost, Kevin Adams is more than willing to go ahead and acquire a player. Now, the tricky part here is, how much are you giving up? That is the main question when you're weighing on whether the Sabres are going to make a deal for a specific player. Now, Timo Meyer, the ask is going to be at least the equivalent of three first-round picks, plus you have to sign the player to a long-term contract. For Kevin Adams right now, given all the players that he's going to have to sign within the next 12 months, really, you know, 12 to 15 months, depending on what player you're, you're referring to, it's really difficult to not only pay the acquisition costs, but then also set yourself up to, to sign that player long-term. It's, it's a tricky spot to be in. Uh, I think that's the type of move maybe they make this summer when the price is lower on, on making that kind of a trade. And also when you have a better idea who else you're going to sign within the group. Now, I think the right pending unrestricted free agent, you know, just throwing a name out there. We'll say Tyler Brutuzzi, Luke Shin, defenseman. You know, we'll see what, what the Edmonton Oilers do if they have to move a defenseman, if they manage to acquire Eric Carlson? Is that an area the Sabres like to address? I think that they're going to be active. Kevin Adams is making a lot of calls, sort of casting a wide net to get a, a better gauge of what the prices are. And they do have prospects they're willing to move. It's just when you're you're talking about possibly trading Matt Savoy, Yuri Kulik, and a first-round pick, that's just not the type of deal that Kevin Adams is going to make. So we'll see. Right now, it is very difficult to make trades this time of year. We know the prices get really outrageous. There's a lot of teams still in the mix and in the playoff hunt where they think they can, they're that one player away. We'll see. Still got three weeks here before the deadline. There's plenty of movement that can be made. Next question. What are the odds the Sabres sign Devin Levi at the conclusion of his season at Northeastern? And does he get, get some games in Rochester? I think the odds are very, very high, very good, or however you want to put it. The Devin Levi does sign his entry-level contract this spring. He has nothing else to prove at Northeastern. That team is not any closer to winning a national title, in my opinion. He has mastered the college game as much as a goalie can. Now, that team has not been nearly as strong as they were supposed to. His play and goal is a big reason why they're making that late push and could be an NCAA tournament team. What the Sabres need to see is how is Devin Levi fair against professional shooters? We all know he's not he's he's under six foot. There are goalies in the league who have had great success being small on the smaller end. UC Soros of the National Predators one in particular. But until you really see Devin Levi facing those pro shooters, that's how he's going to work on his game. You know, he's not really testing himself at this point, other than managing expectations by being in goal for Northeastern. So he's maxed out at that point. All signs point to him signing with the Sabres. They would love to get him games in Rochester. We'll see where the Amherst stand at that point. They're not looking like a playoff team right now. If they make a push, there's meaningful games to be played. We'll see. I think that <clears throat> confidence is very high within the Sabres at Levi. That contract is going to be done whenever uh, Northeastern season ends. Next question. With as much cap space as the Sabres have, do they acquire a high a high price rental or do they – sort of just wait wait and see um, before adding such a player. Like I said, 
it's all going to come down to acquisition costs. I mentioned Tyler Bertuzzi, a uh, winger for the Detroit Red Wings, in our roundtable that was in the Monday paper because he's underperformed last year of a contract. I know that it's a divisional team. Steve Eiserman is always, you know, who knows what he has up his sleeve, what he's looking to uh, to acquire in exchange for Bertuzzi. He's a player I'm making a call on, though, right? Like, the, the stock has dropped considering his performance. The market is kind of smaller or is speculated to be smaller for Bertuzzi because he's unvaccinated. Is, can a, a Canadian team acquire him right now given just all the, you know, I know the pandemic restrictions have been lifted, but there's still some possible complications there. He's someone I would look into. You know, defense is obviously an area of need for this group. It's just that you look whether it's right shot or left shot, so many teams are looking for a defenseman right now that Kevin Adams is going to to really wait and see what what makes the most sense in terms of what you're paying. I do think by before it's all said and done that they will add a defenseman. Just a matter of who who that's going to be, what the skill set, left handed, right handed, whatever it may be. All right, let's keep moving on. Does Jason Bottle deserve more credit for the current success of the Sabers? This is an interesting one. Um, nobody really wants to give Botterill credit for the Rasmus Dahlin drafting because everybody knew that guy was going first overall, and a lot of calamity got the Sabres to the point where they were even in position to draft Dahlin. That's fine. I, I understand that argument. But you look at that 2018 draft, and although they did miss in the later rounds, which you never you never want to see as a general manager – they did land Matias Samuelson at the beginning of the second round when a lot of a lot of people outside the NHL were pretty were questioning Samuelson's game. He's more of a throwback type of defenseman. Does this guy have the skating, the play, you know, the puck moving ability to be a, a full time top four NHL guy? Considering where you're drafting him, well, that pick has looked outstanding at this point, and. Uh, it's no no secret why they signed Samuelson to a seven year contract. 2017, um, the Sabers, you know, Botterill didn't have his scouting staff. He had the leftovers from Tim Murray's regime, and you know, you look at UPL in the second round, great pickup. You know, regardless of what you think UPL is going to turn into, to get a goalie who's obviously making an impact in the NHL at this point, I think that's a solid acquisition. Now, when you you when you measure that 2017 draft class, it's going to come down to Casey Middlestad, where he was drafted, all the the misdevelopment time because of the coach, because of the injuries. I don't think we can exactly measure Middlestad long term yet for that draft class, but they did pass up some really good players there. So I understand why there's some question marks in 2017. Now, 2019, once Botterill had his staff in place, they had their process. They knew, okay, here is how we're going to scout. Here is where we're covering in areas. This is what our scouting model is because it does take time to develop that. They got Dylan Cousins, Ryan Johnson, Eric Portillo, Aaron Huglin, Philip Siderquest, and Lucas Rusek. Pretty good group. That is pretty good, especially to hit on Cousins when you could have gone a different direction and chosen some other guys who, ha- who haven't reached this development mark that Cousins has. A very a gutsy pick that has turned out really well. Now, of course, you know you add the Jeff Skinner trade, a very good one for for the Sabers. You know you can question the contract all you want, but what happens if the Sabers don't sign Jeff Skinner there? You gave up a lot to get him. He signs elsewhere, raises questions around the league. The guys not want to sign in Buffalo, even though they've had success there. They've played there. What's the deal? Okay, so and of course you got other factors. You know there are reports that you know. Did, did ownership push Botterill to go to go term when he wasn't comfortable? Who knows? All right, I'm not going to speculate. I don't have reporting to support that. I'm just saying that, you know, the contract's another thing. Skinner's performing well now with a different coach. We'll see. Tage Thompson, again, a nice, <laughs> a good player to get, right? You know, you could say all you want about the Ryan O'Reilly trade, but to get Tage Thompson once his development reached where it was supposed to be, you at least have to get Botterill and his scouting staff. I know Jeremiah Crow was the pro scout covering that area. He's still in the Sabres, in Sabres hockey ops now. Hey, they had a good eye for a good player. And whether the development didn't go well in a bottle or whatever, still, you got to give credit to the guy. Henry Yoki Haru, okay, a defenseman who's often picked on by Sabres fans, which I, you know, we can go on. I, I disagree with a lot of the discourse there. 
really good to get Henry Yoki Haru for Alex Nylander. Now, what what Botterill, what really what really hurt him was some bad trades. You can go to Michael Froelich. You know, get riding, ri- getting rid of Marco Scandella probably a little too soon when you could have gotten more for, for him at the deadline. But again, remember how Scandella performed in the previous season, and maybe they just wanted to maximize what they had at that point in time. So there were misfires, to be sure, um, which I think ultimately led to some of the issues this team had. Plus, they hired a coach who didn't maximize some of the players that Botterill went out and got. Brandon Montour, Colin Miller. So, you know, we don't know who was in the room or who had the, the final say on the coach hiring, whether it was Botterill, how much of a say to ownership have. I, I assume both of them were aligned on that decision, and it didn't work out. So, in the end, I think that Botterill did some good. Some, you know, he drafted or acquired some of the, the members of this young core. You can't overlook that fact. But in the end, I think that. If Jason Bottle could do it over, there there are some areas that he would certainly change. And to remember, when he took over, culture was a big issue with this group. You know, so not only are you working on building the on ice product, you're trying to to make tweaks behind the scenes to get guys to really address what was wrong in that room. He went on got Jason Palmanville, Connor Sherry, guys who have been in big playoff games, and in the end, you know, with what their roles were, how much influence can they really have when you know the you know, the main leader of that group was, you know, Jack Eichel, Yed Sam Reinhardt, and Rasmus Ristolainen. Okay, next question. I'm going to try to get two more in. We're already at 12 minutes. Do you think Jay- Kevin Adams looked to tr- draft a defenseman in the first round this year since they have really stockpiled a, a decent number of decent number of really talented forwards here? Yes. Okay. Short answer is yes. Defense is really going to pre- be a priority for the scouting staff going into this draft. I'm sure they are doing not maybe doubling up on some of the in-person evaluations to get a really good read on the defenseman at the top of this class. Because when you're building your draft board, which they're not at that point yet, you want to have a really good feeling about those those defensemen if that's the area you want to target. But in the end, you're not you're not selecting players based on position when you're talking about the first round of the draft. You know, if they have a pick that's later in the first round, sure, you can go, you can think more about need, but when the player's not helping for you for a few years, it's a really dangerous game to, to consider need. When in reality, I mean, you, you think about the defensemen that are in this group right now. You got Samuelson, you got Darlene. Yoki Haru is going to be a part of this longer term, in my opinion. Just it's a matter of what the number is, what is his role longer term. And of course, you got Owen Power. So when you have really. Four of your top six, you know, you whatever the order it is, you know, we could debate on that. We'll see where things align. You're in a really good spot to where you it takes some of the pressure off. But of course, I think that it is going to be an emphasis, no doubt, as they're deciding who they scout and what they're how they're approaching their evaluations in the coming months. Final question before we wrap it up: Is there a potential Brett Murray, Brandon Byro, Linus Weisbach, or Lukas Rusek? Uh, is there a possibility any of those guys down with the Amherst fit into the Sabres' bottom six in the near future? Um, I think there is. There, There's certain areas of each of those players' games you mentioned that need work. You know, Brett Murray, he has so many intriguing qualities, but he's got to be able to make plays at the speed the Sabres play. That was a challenge for him as he was with the group longer last season. Had some really promising moments, but it's all about sustaining and – that's going to be the key for him to to get a long term role in the NHL, whether it's in Buffalo or elsewhere. Byro, of course, the he's had a couple of injuries. We'll see about that. I they have to love where his development has gone since he signed out of Penn State, a player that is at least playing himself into this conversation, which isn't something you necessarily thought could happen once he when he first initially joined the organization. Now, Weisbach and Rusek are really interesting players. I think that both of them. Are, are, are going to be NHLers in some way, shape, or form. Now, I think what's holding them back is just the f- look at what the Sabres have right now. I think that those two bring a lot of what Rasmus Asplund has in responsible defense, some playmaking, um, and with Asplund being the healthy scratch, and, well, for the most part, and the Sabres having health on their side in the forward group, that's what's really prevented those two from from car- you know getting that opportunity in Buffalo that maybe they would have in previous seasons. So two guys that are really fascinating to monitor as the season goes into the second half. You know that the Amherst coaching staff wants to get more out of that entire group right now. No question about it. Um, 
And the next, the follow-up question I got in this email from, let me, let me, um, Kyle, Kyle, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so I'm not going to butcher it. Given my last name, I know what that's like. So why is Rochester playing so poorly this season is also what Kyle asked. And we shouldn't be surprised um, at all by some of the, the growing pains that they're going through down there. They've had a lot of injuries. Sean Malone is somebody who was so important to what they did last season. He's had dealt with some injury issues, which is really unfortunate given what that guy has really done to his game over the last couple of years to turn himself into a possible NHL player. Um, the back end, their defense just hasn't performed to the, the potential that you maybe thought they had. You know, guys like Chase Prisky aren't aren't performing at a high level game in and game out. Honestly, Ethan Prowl's been their most consistent defenseman. And, you know, good for Ethan Prowl. Um, you know, he's what he's a really valuable AHL guy, veteran, has a lot of experience, but they wanted to get more out of Prisky, Davies. You know, Pilots had some good moments down there since rejoining the group. They're going to need to get more of that back in. And, of course, a lot of this, guys, is, is youth and experience up front. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to get these young players into a variety of situations at a young age when physically they're not quite ready that, yet. You know, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about Isak Rose and uh, Kozak, Tyson Kozak, Philip Sider Quest, you know, Yuri Cooley, you know, some of, you know, a few of those guys have what it takes physically right now to maybe win those puck battles, get to the hard areas to score. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done to their games. It's their first year in North America for three of the four of those. You know, Kozak is, is still a little undersized for the role that the Sabres envision him playing, not only in the American League, but in the National League, in the National Hockey League. So a lot of what his game is going to be is just natural maturation, getting bigger, getting stronger. You can't speed up that process. I still think his game is... He's a really fascinating player to watch. Cider Quest is really along the same lines. He's just going to have to learn how to use his body, use that size, use that strength. Roseanne Kulik gets really good moments and some moments where you're just, I'm sure there's frustra frustration with the coaching staff because they see what those guys are capable of. I just think that there was an unrealistic expectation for not only those two prospects, but the rest of that really young team given what Jack Quinn and J.J. Paterka accomplished last season, which is really an outlier. You know, what those guys are able to do at such a young age, it's it's, unpre you know, it's pretty unprecedented considering, you know, the level of competition they're facing, the grind of the schedule. You know, I, I wouldn't have any concerns about what they have in Rochester. Kisikov is another guy that I really want to see as he gets bigger and stronger. You know, what does the skating look like? What does the playmaking ability look like? Because right now he's playing a little bit too, mo too much on the perimeter. You could say the same for Rose. And, you know, that'll evolve. You know, that coaching staff down there got Quinn and Paterka to really take their game to that next level and get to those scoring areas. Going to be a really interesting group to monitor in the second half of the season. That's it for me. That was uh, a quick rapid fire. We still got 20 minutes and I'm Lance Lysowski from the Buffalo News out in Los Angeles. Please keep your eyes out for my coverage throughout the week on this three game California road trip. If you have any questions, reach out. If not, have a great day. Thank you very much.